The following program is sponsored by the Association of the United States Army. Today on Government Matters, Norway is one of just a few NATO countries that shares a border with Russia. The commander of the Norwegian Army explains how their operations have changed since the start of the war in Ukraine. And Sweden and Finland are expected to become the newest members of NATO. The heads of both countries' armies share how that could change military dynamics in the region. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the show that delivers insights on federal government programs, people, and operations. I'm Mimi Gerges. Norway has been described as NATO's eyes and ears in the Arctic. The chief of Norway's army, Major General Lars Lervik, sat down with us at the AUSA annual conference on October 11th. General, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, and thank you much for having me. You know, you've been uh, cooperating with the American military for decades. You say the goal is integration. What does that mean? What would it look like? Looking back at our, our past, um, I, I at least usually say that we, we, we did a lot of freezing and being, being miserable together uh, in the same area or on the same exercise, but we did not really integrate. What we have done over the last few years is we are based on operational plans. We are planning how to solve our missions both in deterrence and defense. That is the driver for both the training we do together and the experimentation we do together. And that's when I mean when we're doing these three, th these three things together, that's integration uh, and a higher level of cooperation, um, which I think is, is, is the way forward. And Norway has donated thousands uh, of weapons, tens of millions of dollars in military aid to Ukraine. What specific impact has your aid had on Ukraine? It has been, compared to the U.S., it has had a, a small but I think important uh, impact on, on the battlefield. And we know that from the gunners that we are using our old guns, which we have trained, and they are giving us feedback, if not on a daily basis, on, but on a weekly basis, of the impact they're literally having on the Russian armed forces. Has that aid that you've given to Ukraine had a negative impact on your army's, uh, not just capabilities, but your stocks? Some of our stocks are, are, are being, being influenced by this. That's, uh, that's, not a, uh, that's not a secret. But we are trying to manage a sufficient level, having a minimum level, while at the same time doing our utmost to support the Ukrainians in their fights. You're, you're a NATO country and you do share a, albeit small, border with Russia. Ha have you strengthened the defense of that area? What have you been doing to protect Norway from that? Right. We have been working at least since 2014 on a, on a, a strengthening of the Norwegian Armed Forces, including buying F-35s, P-8s, new submarines. We are investing in a, a number of systems in the Army. So that has been going on for a while, uh, but then, then in, a, in a moderate pace, I would like to say. Uh, what we have done uh, this year is increasing readiness at the border. Uh, we are keeping a close eye on what's happening on the eastern side, and also, of course, made some uh, adjustments to our own readiness. Uh, but overall, the situation in our area is calm because of most of the land forces are actually deployed to the Ukraine. So in many ways, it's calmer, um, isolated uh, in our area than it used to be. Will you be increasing your defense spending as a percentage of your total budget? Yes, we, we have just for the next year, we are talking about a 15% a, a, um, increase, uh, uh, sorry, a 10% increase. Uh, quite a lot of that will actually be absorbed by the increase of cost, but, but it is an increase, yes. What effect would Sweden and Finland's um, expected joining of NATO have on, uh, on Norway? I think it, it will have a positive effect on, on the whole of NATO, because we can now actually do the integration, which I, I, I briefly mentioned, by integrating our plans. And for Norway, of course, it's, it's our two closest neighbors. And we are now member, members of the same alliance. Things will be lots, lots easier, I think. In late September, there were explosions at the Nord Stream pipelines. It's believed to be sabotage. How is the Norwegian army responding to that? The Norwegian armed forces have responded with, with a wide variety of, of actions. Of course, in the increasing our, our intelligence services, uh, monitoring these kind of threats, 
cyber security, um, uh, land forces, especially from the Home Guard, securing the land-based installations, and the Air Force and the Navy um, maintaining a presence in our um, uh, oil and gas fields. Secretary of Defense Austin called Norway, quote, NATO's eyes and ears in the Arctic. Uh, what's your perspective on Norway's role in the Arctic? I think we, 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 we live in the Arctic, which means it's, uh, we, we, I think we understand it. And, and in regards to, to military, we have been present there all the time. Meaning also for the Russians, they are used to being, to meeting Norwegian soldiers on the border or ships or aircraft um, in the Barents Sea. So I think that's why we have a, a fairly stabilizing re relationship uh, in the Arctic as of now. And of course, when you talk about the Arctic, you have to talk about climate change. Um, and Russia has increased its presence in, in, the, in the Arctic. What's your biggest concern for that area? I think uh, the, the biggest military concern is, is the fact that, that uh, uh, very close to the Norwegian border, that is still the hub of the, uh, the Russian strategic submarines and their, their, their second strike capabilities. So that is still the, the major concern uh, for Norway, but I think for, for NATO and the US as well. Um, on a larger scale, I think that the whole um, uh, climate change is accelerating and you can see that changes uh, are, are threefold up in, uh, up in the northern parts of Norway and how that will play out in the future, well that is something that concerns me um, as much as an officer as a citizen to be honest. What are your objectives in coming to Washington for this trip, not only with uh, your counterparts in the, in the US military but with American defense contractors as well? Right. Uh, I'm here, first of all, it's a great opportunity to, to, to re-establish and reinforce links with both US and other allied uh, colleagues. And then I'm also looking uh, specifically at some, some key areas uh, which I'm looking to, to discuss with industry. It's long range fires, it's air defense, and it's, it's different types of viewing manned and unmanned uh, teaming, uh, including counter UAS and all those things as well. Well, General Lervik, welcome to Washington and thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you very much. Coming up, the commanders of Norway's neighbors, Finland and Sweden, join us to explain what they're doing to deter Russian aggression in the Arctic. That's straight ahead on Government Matters. The U.S. has a history of defense cooperation with the Nordic countries of Finland and Sweden. That collaboration could increase with their likely accession to NATO. I spoke with Major General Carl Engelbrexton, the commander of the Swedish Army, and Lieutenant General Pasi Valamaki, commander of the Finnish Army. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. Uh, General Carl, I want to start with you. As you know, Russia partly justifies its invasion of Ukraine by blaming NATO for enlargement um, up to Russia's borders. How do you respond to that? Well, I say that the uh, current world order that we believe in is the rules-based order where countries and nations decide based on the will of the population and the leadership on what direction when it comes to security policy that they want to use. And it seems like many nations want to join NATO for the will of the free people. And it has nothing to do with uh, that NATO is an aggressive partner towards someone. It's, a, it's about defending the alliance. What are your thoughts, General Posse, on, on NATO enlargement as a threat to Russia from their perspective? NATO is a defensive organization by nature. There are a lot of like-minded nations, um, allies within the alliance, looking at defending their own nation and, and the alliance. So I think that that is what it is and how it should be understood. Well, currently, uh, two countries have not uh, agreed to uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO. That's Turkey and Hungary. What are you expecting from them and what's the timeline? Uh, that is a, a totally a political question for those, to, uh, the, those nations for, to decide. Um, I, I just can expect that they, they will have their political processes and, and hope it will be close by uh, very soon. What advantages, General Carl, does Finland and Sweden bring to NATO? Um, what, what, what should the, especially the United States, expect to gain? It's many um, things that we actually bring to the, to the table. But to start with, 
the first and more obvious one is territory. So if you look at the northern part of Europe and especially the Nordic Baltic countries, together we constitute one operational area. And bringing Sweden and Finland into the NATO context means that we can plan together in the same geography, the same climate, and to be better prepared. And uh, the NATO process will allow that in a much more smoother way than it is today. And what about the Arctic? Would, would that deter Russian aggression in the Arctic? Of course, if we join forces, the synergy of, of the forces already existing in the Arctic, so especially Sweden, Finland and Norway, the way we know how to fight in that terrain, in that climate, if we can use our forces in the same context and be well planned and prepared, that will be more deterrent than it is today. General Posse, I want to ask you about the, the size of your defense spending as a percentage of GDP. Can you give me an idea of, of what you spend on, on defense? Actually, uh, we start, we've made a decision last uh, December to purchase 62 F-35s. And that's a, that's a 10 billion euro contract for an extensive period of time. And that actually took our, our uh, GDP percent uh, up to 2%. And uh, in the spring after the invasion uh, to uh, Ukraine, the Finnish government made another uh, appropriation bill of 1.7 billion euros for the next three years uh, to ramp up spare parts, ammunition and such, which basically takes us closer to 2.6% for the, for the next few years. So I, I would say that uh, thinking about the Finnish taxpayers are, are putting their um, showing the money, as, as you say, and um, I think we are creating a credible force uh, with credible funding and the defense, uh, the, the will to defend Finland as part of the alliance is high as ever. What about you, General Kov, for, for Sweden? Our government has taken the decision that we will, as quickly as possible, rise to 2%. Right now, uh, it's, it's pending. It's no later than 28, but I think it will be moved to the left because um, there is uh, opportunities to, to do investment and uh, it's the same as in Finland. The, the public support of spending more on defense is there and it's necessary and, and we have the plans to do it. I, I wonder, uh, General Posse, uh, from Finland's perspective, how would NATO membership change your collaboration with the U.S. Army and, and your relationship? I think we have a very, very good working relationship at the bilateral level now already with the U.S., uh, uh, Navy, Air and Army. But of course it will intensify and, and give us more, um, more opportunities to uh, complement each other within the alliance. But we, we are already starting it with, with allies. In, in this respect. So I, I see only good, good possibilities ahead of us. What about Sweden? How will your interaction with the US Army change? Well, we came from the same background as Finland. So we have a trilateral political cooperation um, that is decided on the political level. That will, of course, only expand and, and be deepened when and if we will join NATO. And, um, it will increase and it has already done. We have a very good relationship with all levels in US. I will sign this week with General McConville, a bilateral staff to staff agreement. And uh, we have already big support from the Fifth Corps, First Division, uh, exercising together with us. And, and together we exercise up north uh, in the cold climate to be better prepared for Arctic war fight. You mentioned that trilateral agreement. What, what does that uh, what are, what's the significance of that? What's practically what do you what do you what do you gain? What is what do the Americans gain? It gives us the possibility on on the armed forces level, uh, the joint chief of, of defense level, but also the armed forces services, Army, Navy, Air Force. It allows us to have a closer relationship uh, because we are of course politically steered, and uh, that's how it should be. All right, gentlemen, we'll take a quick pause right here, and then we'll come back.
I'm back with Major General Carl Engel Brexton. He's the commander of the Swedish Army, and Lieutenant General Posse Valamaki is the commander of the Finnish Army. Uh, general Posse, I want to ask you, uh, you met recently with the commanding general of U.S. Army uh, Europe and Africa in September. What came out of that discussion? General Williams visited us, and that was uh, a good a good moment for him to stop in Finland and get an orientation of what we are about. Our structures, our force posture, uh, spending of um, our uh, the procurement, and of course because he's land commander for NATO at the same time, so it was very beneficial. So we spoke about interoperability, how to develop that in practice, not just PowerPoints, and, uh, but really how to do that. Also about uh, Ukraine, the situation as a whole. So it was a good orientation uh, from many respects. And of course, we agreed on, on how to go forward with training with the different uh, US troops in theater, as well as from the continental US. And uh, General Carl, he visited you as well? Yes, he did. And, and we spoke about basically the same matters, but it's, it's also about uh, friendship because uh, Daryl was invited for, for several years, but then came COVID and uh, I wanted to take him to the oldest uh, war academy in the world that is situated in Sweden. So it is in Sweden. Because, uh, you know, he, he was uh, the commandant of West Point. I wanted to tease him with that a little bit. So. <laughs> Apart, apart from the serious questions, it's about uh, well, friendship and trust. General Posse did talk about interoperability, yeah. which is going to be extremely important in those um, allied operations. How do you actually get to that point? Is it a matter of setting standards and everybody's got to meet them? It is um, different venues. Standards is one, procedures is one. And uh, in the end, it's about human interoperability, understanding friendship and relationship and understanding different perspectives and cultures. And, and General um, uh, Carl, Sweden is working with the U.S. to increase stability in the Baltic Sea region. What is the Swedish Army's role in that? Well, the, the Baltic Sea region, primarily the role is uh, predominantly for our Navy and for, for the Air Force. But of course, we do that as well by exercising regularly with Finland uh, and with, uh, with Norway but of course also uh, with our Baltic uh, friends ar around that area. But as you know, uh, to move armies is a bit harder than uh, moving Air Force and Navy. Uh, so we do it predominantly with our neighbors, Finland and Denmark. General Valamaki, I wanna ask you about how uh, Finland and, and Sweden joining NATO would affect Baltic security. I think it's only gonna be going to improve and, and and make it more stable when we are predictable. We are very stable as nations, but also we are very capable. Together we train a lot. Yeah. And uh, just last uh, couple of months ago, we had a, a significant uh, size exercise up north, which was called on very short notice. And we d it was a manifestation of our long-term commitment to train together and, and showing interoperability. And then joining also was uh, UK troops from Estonia, so, so uh, in many respects, we are showing that we are shoulder to shoulder, and I think that shows also uh, oh, increases the stability in the area and predictability of, of how, who we are, what we are for, standing for. The Swedish Armed Forces um, and U.S. Special Forces conducted exercises with the HIMARS yeah. in northern Sweden. What was the outcome? Well, the outcome was, of course, success. We uh, mission accomplished, so we shot live fire, full range of HIMARS. Uh, as you might know, we have uh, big, uh, big training areas in both our countries, so that's possible to do. That is something that we can contribute with. And um, so it was um, a, a good uh, capability for us to learn more about. We would like to go there. I'd like to ask you both specifically how you're supporting the war in Ukraine. Uh, well, we uh, first, that starts with the political level, but on the practical, tactical level, like many other countries, we have um, uh, given them uh, material. Uh, 
some of the um, good war fighting capabilities that we have, that is man-borne anti-tank missiles, uh, well known in the US, 84s, that is a big bunch of it, but also, uh, also other stuff that has not been yet public, so I, I stick to the man-borne uh, 84. But we have done training with Ukraine for a very long time, uh, especially when it comes to mining and demining and, and tactics. And General Posse, I mean, you share a long border with Russia. How are you defending that border and supporting the war in Ukraine? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have to be very conscious of the packages that we send to Ukraine. We have sent so far eight packages. Some of it is money for them to use to buy some um, satellite communications, for example. Uh, some are uh, ammunition and uh, military equipment, which we tend not to talk more about. But I think the, uh, the main, main support is not only material, but it is also the political side, which our prime minister just recently in Prague say, stated quite clearly when, when she was asked, uh, how, do you how do you end the war in Ukraine? And her answer was, Russia leaves Ukraine. That's how you stop the war. And that's how we'll end this interview. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for being on the program. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the federal government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges. The previous program was sponsored by the Association of the United States Army.